Quando lottiamo per migliorarci, tutto intorno a noi diventa più bello. 
Non ci sono passi falsi, se l'obiettivo è dare il massimo per noi stessi e per chi è sempre al nostro fianco. In Monge lo sappiamo, perché ciò che facciamo bene oggi migliora i nostri domani. Con questa filosofia vi offriamo il meglio della nostra esperienza. Monge Natural Super Premium, alimenti made in Italy di alta qualità per il benessere dei nostri amici a quattro zampe. Monge, la famiglia italiana del pet food. Good evening everyone and welcome. Good evening everyone and welcome to another edition of Talking Dogs with Dante. As usual, I'm your host, Dante Lucin from Croatia. And the sponsors of the evening, to which of course, as always, we thank for their support, are Monge and Dogoteca. Uh, sorry if tonight I'm going to be a little bit out of space. Uh, I have some uh, problems with puppies at home and uh, this is why we have also been late a little bit. But uh, here we are now ready to have a great evening. Um, I'm sure that it's going to be fabulous because I know Nicolas for so many years um, and I'm happy to see that so many people from all around the world are already tuning in um, to, to see the, the interview tonight. Uh, I want to say that uh, last week we had an exclusive interview with the president of the Croatian Kennel Club and the secretary of the Croatian Kennel Club, um, talking about the World Dog Show, uh, which will happen next year in Zagreb. Um, obviously, the things are, are uh, going, going quick and uh, everything is being organized well and quick, so I'm inviting all of you once again um, to come to Zagreb next year, but now, of course, is the time to go back to what Talking Dogs with Ante was made for, and this is to um, talk to famous breeders, uh, doggy people who have been in dogs uh, in different roles uh, during their life. Uh, Nicolas is definitely one of them. Good evening, Nicolas, and welcome to Talking Dogs with Ante. Good evening. Good evening to everyone. I feel uh, especially honored to be here with you. I've been watching you since you started, as you know, I'm sure. Thanks so, a lot. I know you, you have been uh, watching it uh, quite often, and this is always nice to hear. Um, as you know, I, I, we, well, we know each other for quite a long time, and, and we have a, a big respect one for another, and I'm happy that, uh, that you are here tonight, not just as a great ambassador of your breed, but also I know that a lot of Greek people are extremely proud of you and happy that uh, tonight you are going to be a Greek ambassador also of the dog world, so this is wonderful. Uh, anyhow, I see that, uh, that there are so many people uh, watching from all around the world. Uh, let, me, let me see quickly uh, who is there. Of course, uh, our dear friend Andrew Brace is saying hello, everyone enjoy the evening. Alex is watching from Mexico, uh, Fabiana from Italy, uh, Luca saying Er Zeppelin Owen, Er Zeppelin Giulietta Ariacas Selene Presenti, um, Rachel is watching from North Carolina, Rob from New Zealand, Andrea saying good evening and a happy Easter time from Ruski Toy Austria. Very excited to listen to next two hours to a very interesting interview. Um, Julie is saying hello, this is going to be an excellent evening. Nicolas is a wonderful person. I have the privilege to call him friend. So proud of you, Nicolas. So a lot of nice messages already starting even before you started talking, Nicolas. So that means something. Uh, but listen, uh, normally we, we first go to the past and we go, you know, to, to find out how did somebody start in dogs and so on and so on and so on. Uh, I want to start with crafts. I want that because we spoke, uh, was it I think two weeks ago, we spoke with Matteo, who is uh, uh, the breeder of, of uh, Blondie, who was reserved best in Detroit crafts. Uh, Matteo was also showing her. You have been backstage there with me. Uh, as the owner, we have shared the, the same uh, nerves and, and everything. Tell me everything. I want to know how was Crafts 2023 for you from the moment you have arrived to Birmingham, uh, from the moment when you have won the CC, the breed, the group, and then Reserve Best in Show. I want to know it all. Now, let's say how many, it is about 20 days now uh, since Crafts. Now everything is a bit calmed down. Tell, tell me your Crafts experience. Well, <laughs> um, I went to the UK long before crafts because um, I am showing a beautiful uh, bitch, bred my very dear friend Helen, 
so uh, I was very lucky to win personally a very prestigious centennial best in show a week before crafts, showing myself. And then uh, Mateo came over. We always meet at um, West Wickham. Uh, we have uh, somehow an English family there. And so, uh, and then we went up uh, to Birmingham by train. Uh, I must say, Luisa and uh, um, a friend from Greece and a groomer, Agilus, uh, brought Blondie by car all the way. Uh, so we met actually in Birmingham at the hotel. Um, so that was it. Now, um, it was very funny because Matteo had never actually shown Blondie before, which <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, nobody. Uh, a new picture to everything, okay? <laughs> and uh, I must say, he showed her better than I've ever done in my entire life. I mean, um, there was uh, the open beach class, and we were um, one against each other, actually. And everybody was, uh, what are you doing? You're sewing together in the same class. And I said, well, this is for the judge to decide <laughs> who is the better dog. And I must say a huge thank you to Michaela Holt. She did uh, uh, the most difficult job of the day. She had a huge class full of quality. And when Mateo, Mateo showed Blondie around the rink, uh, they gave me goosebumps. I was watching there and I, I just was left. Uh, okay, you are winning it. It's all yours. <laughs> so um, obviously we groomed the night before, like you do. We had a lot of uh, help all the way from New Zealand, Greece, from everywhere, <laughs> like you do in the hotel room. Uh, of course, you know, that day goes without understanding what happens, really. Um, when they won the breed, um, we had to rush everybody. I must say the, experience, the, the, the love uh, we experienced on the day, it was fantastic from all over the world. I, I still haven't made it uh, to actually reply to the messages. Maybe there are, I'm sure there are more than 1,000 messages. And um, so, yeah, it was fantastic. Of course, Luisa was there. And, uh, you know, first time at Graz, Luisa is the human mom of Blondie. Uh, she does really live with us. Um, uh, so, uh, first time at Graz in her life. <laughs> and then, not, with, with, not a bad experience. <laughs> no, not a bad experience. Some of these people we can spoil too much. If yes. you know Paola Siciliano from Italy, very spoiled. <laughs> it was a lovely experience. And then, I mean, I thought Matteo in the group and Blondie were fabulous. I was just like, I was so scared of the Border Collie. <laughs> behind the scenes, <laughs> which I loved. And... Um, um, everybody thinks I do a lot of homework before going to a dog show. Well, I don't, as a matter of fact. Um, I was so impressed with um, Rene Sporty Willis that did the, the group. I was so impressed by her manners in the ring, by the way she handled it all, everything. I think she was, uh, well, fantastic. And uh, well, that was the first day. I will, I will interrupt you for a second. Um, uh, I don't know personally Rene, but uh, she has been, um, you know, she she is written in the gold letters um, of the Croatian kinology because actually uh, she was judging best in show at the European Dog Show in Bratislava many many years, and that was the first time ever that a Croatian person and a Croatian dog won best in show under her. So Rene is quite special for the Croatian people, and I must say she is uh, she is one of these people um, that when you see you can see just the class and the knowledge and experience. And I'm very sorry that she is not traveling around as much as she was doing before, because I think she is absolutely one of the nicest uh, uh, judges that you can meet around. Now you can continue. <laughs> wonderful. I mean, uh, wonderful. Um, I met her the day I met her after the group, obviously, for the pictures. Um, we never met before. And then I met her the day after. Um, 
on the corridors somewhere in the NEC. I'm just absolutely amazed. You know, um, there's, I met um, Mikael uh, then, and he said, are you in love with her? <laughs> I said, well... <laughs> Nearly. <laughs> Nearly, exactly. Anyway, and that was it. We knew this beautiful, beautiful Lagotto with this um, wonderful handler from Spain who lives in Croatia, had won the group the yes. day before. And um, I cannot say enough congratulations to uh, Javier and you and everybody involved with Orca for how beautiful she was. Thank you so much. Um, and that's uh, really, you know, uh, it's so wonderful to be second, to arrive second, and have somebody that you that you really admire in front of you, and yeah. be actually able to recognize it. And I think this is something that is probably missing a little bit from our sport. Um, so uh, I really cannot stress enough. We were out for Javier. You know, we both have a very bad habit, so we were out. <laughs> yeah, I know you were going. You were going out quite often, both of you. For a breath of, uh, you know, fresh air, and uh, it was fine. It was Luis also there, and uh, anyway, and uh, if he's listening anywhere, and I, why don't you have an interview with Javier for God's sake? Uh, well, this you should ask him. Everybody is asking me this because he doesn't want to do it. Um, we are working on it, both Andrew and I, trying to push him to do it one day, but uh, he is so stubborn that uh, I, cannot, I'm, I cannot say it's going to happen. But we are working on it. This is all what I'm going to say. I, I know the answer to it. Change the interviewer. Put Andrew to make the interview. It doesn't change anything. I, we, are trying, we are also trying that option. We are trying all the options. We would give him, even if you want, to be interviewed by Oprah Quintry, Winfrey. But uh, for the moment, we are not succeeding, but we are trying. Slowly, slowly, we are trying. Okay. And, uh, I, what you said, I think it's amazing. Of course, uh, Crafts itself being the greatest and the biggest dog show in the world, um, to have two persons outside of the UK sharing the podium, then four persons talking about Javier and myself and you and Matteo, um, who know each other for so many years, being friends and so on. It was really, in that way, also a special um, special feeling and when we went later on to this uh, celebration and this dinner you know it's nice to be surrounded by friends it, it was really well very special. Wonderful. yeah wonderful and then you know you know it and uh, but I really have to say it to for people to know when we went for best in show uh, in that hall uh, all the group winners it was like family it was fantastic and uh, I'm sorry I couldn't send you enough pictures uh, today because, you know, the picture with, uh, we have, a, I was sending, I was making pictures to send to Andrew and yeah. uh, uh, just to see who were there. And then for a minute I see David, Dave, Dave Bennett, mm -hmm. wonderful Dave. Uh, I've changed his uh, nickname, you know, he was dependable, now he's wonderful. <laughs> Okay. If Dave wins the group, <laughs> it will be <laughs> like family here. Yeah. So no, it's, it's fantastic. It's wonderful and and and, uh, and I must say uh, uh, in this special place where we had this pre-ring and everything, um, uh, the lady from the Karen Club was incre incredibly nice, so nice to all of us. Yeah, and I mean it was it was a, a very and I you know. People ask you later on, uh, you know, how does it go when you win the group? You know, what it happens? Do they do makeup for you and everything? And then there was one comment, uh, comment here uh, for you uh, from Bettina. And she says, uh, ask Nicholas what Dimitri said when he came home after crafts without the cup. And I can tell you that all the people who were coming to our home, you know, and all the journalists and everybody who was coming to make all these interviews with Orca, always the first question is, and where is this wonderful trophy? And they say, in England, it's just for the photos. We don't have anything, just a small rosette. So, yes, what, what did they say to you when you came home without the cup? Uh, uh, everybody has seen Luisa, who's not a very high-profile dog person, 
and uh, but nobody knows Dimitri who is uh, in the backstage of it, of it all. Um, Oki makes his videos of his dogs, you won't imagine. Luisa does all the brush brushing and grooming. And uh, what he does, he collects uh, trophies. He loves the trophies, Dimitris. And this is it. He doesn't even come to the dog shows. And, uh, but he loves the trophies. And he loves looking after the dogs like they both do. They love their dogs. I mean, I'm sure that is so. And they don't really care that much about dog shows, <laughs> which is <laughs> incredible. <laughs> Yeah. But uh, this is how it is. Um, and he wanted the trophy back. Where is the trophy? I said, yeah. no, this trophy we don't take home, you see. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, you know, everybody was saying, oh, but where is this wonderful trophy? You know, and I said, well, they don't give you the trophy. The trophy is just there for a photo. Ah, OK. But there was also the nice one from the group. Where is that one? I said, you don't get also that one. <laughs> so it was <laughs> almost insane. Eh? But you've got the champions. Repeat again, please. We have got the champagnes. Yes, 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 this, yes. Yeah, this, yes, this, yes. No, but uh, yeah, the, the, the story of the trophy, I can see it's already famous everywhere because everybody wants to see them, but unfortunately, we cannot show them. Um, anyhow, Nicholas, let's go back now uh, to your childhood, to your past. Um, I, have, I have read your CV that you sent me. I have found a lot of um, interesting information there that I suppose also some of your friends don't know about you. Uh, the, the, the fact is that you started actually walking with this dog called Arapina, and that has been your first contact with the dog already when you were a baby boy. Tell us, tell us about that. Oh, that's very true. I remember myself um, standing up on my two feet and holding this uh, beautiful, wonderful beach that uh, we had at home my grandparents, and uh, this is how I stood up. I can remember, literally remember myself. It's one of the first things I can remember. I grew up in a small hold on Paros. This is the area that it's called uh, Ariakas, really, and means a little born, a little stream in uh, Parian Greek, not even Greek, um, that goes towards the water. And uh, this is how I named my uh, my kennel. My, that, that's my affix, because um, my grandfather had given half of his property on a dry Greek island to actually uh, to get access to this well of water to create this Ariakas, Ariakas in Greek. So um, this is where I was uh, brought up in my childhood. And um, I developed um, a love for animals because, um, yeah, I, I, was, I was obviously surrounded by animals. And... Um, I always say that my grandfather is my first ever mentor as I was a child. I mean, uh, he had a good eye for a dog, but not only. Um, he had actually had a very important principle. Um, there was a neighbor who, had, uh, who was uh, raising uh, goats. He had uh, goats. He would never had anything from him because uh, he didn't treat his animals well. Okay. So my, and whenever we're passing by their house, going anywhere with my grandfather, he wouldn't even allow me to have anything to eat. You know, um, island bricks, they would offer you at the time stuff. And um, my grandfather wouldn't allow me to have anything. If they offer you anything, you would say no. <laughs> okay. They didn't treat their animals well. And uh, he had another uh, policy that is very funny. Um, Every time we had newborn little uh, calves or, what or whatever, he used to name them and he would make one of the grandchildren responsible for some of them. Okay. And um, caring for them and what, whatever. And then um, uh, at some point, obviously, we had to survive. And uh, we learned how it is actually to treat animals well uh, and respect them throughout their lives yeah. and he was a master in that so yes. your grandfather he was breeding dogs he was breeding some hunting breeds yes yes of course um, for, we for had shows. pardon for hunting or also for the shows no there were no dog shows not, in, not on paris island not in greece that was unheard of okay uh, 
We didn't have any any of that. Uh, it was uh, dogs that they were bred and used as dogs were used. They should be general purpose dog and they should do everything. I remember when there was a problem uh, in the stable. For instance, there was one cow that, give, that was giving birth. Uh, the dog would actually come and wake us up. And uh, they were hunting dogs at the same time and dogs that were coming with us everywhere. Um, so, and then uh, we had uh, a friend of my father got these two beautiful Irish setters. That was my first, you know, pedigree dog. And they were red, shining in the, under the, the sun. And I realized what is a pedigree dog. They were so beautiful that, you know, you couldn't resist them. And my grandfather uh, trained them for hunting, really. And this is uh, how it all started. And my, I actually always had to do with ha hunting dogs. Yeah. The English should do right later. You say you started, you yourself actually started with the pointer. That was my first, my very first ambition. And I actually, I thought, I heard somebody saying, uh, English pointers, well, you know, English is probably not allowed, but pointers are for people who really love dogs and know dogs. Okay. So I was very young and I thought that was written for me. I was sure they were talking about me. <laughs> so I wanted a pointer and I actually got a, a very, uh, a puppy, um, a white and orange bitch, beautiful, uh, probably too much of Southern Mediterranean type for today's standards or for my standards of today. But really, um, then I had to move to Athens um, and be with my parents. And the best thing I could get was uh, a cocker. Yeah. So and, and my first. Now, I, yeah, I suppose not many people know. Um, I was also surprised when you wrote me. You wrote me that by the age of 14, you already had three liters of cockers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was fascinated. You know, um, when I was reading, I was when I could find a newspaper, I would go always to the small ads about animals, and I would be so important, uh, so interested. What would that be? What animals are there on sale? What is there? And then I had an uncle who was also um, very, uh, you know, uh, passionate about animals, and he had horses as well so he helped me a little bit with all that so yes the, i had um, um i had this first uh, uh cocker bitch and i bred her to my uh, very good friend up to today uh, who was the veterinarian of my dogs forever uh flora she had a male cocker okay now she has old english by the way her <laughs> son <laughs> And uh, so this is how my breeding career started. I was probably too young for this, but you know. <laughs> yeah. So it was uh, 1981, actually, when you first came uh, across the old English sheepdog. Uh, when you got your first English sheepdog, where where did where did you see the breed? I mean, um, how did you decide that you want really old English sheepdog? How did that happen? Well. Uh, Funnily enough, there was a cartoon on TV of Heidi, and then instead of a Sam Bernard, it was, but it was a cartoon, there was this beautiful uh, white and gray beer there in my, in, my, there in, my, in my eyes. And then I was working in an area of Athens um, called Glyphada, which is like uh, southern suburbs of Athens, and I see that uh, book the old English sheepdogs. That was an edition, I don't remember the year, I think 73 or something. Okay. Uh, I, I just look at it and it was on sale. I went in and these dogs that I had, I had seen actually existed. Um, when we got as a family this first cocker, um, the idea was um, because I have an autistic sister, mm -hmm. Time, uh, her psychiatrist, Mr. Asimakopoulos, suggested that we should have a dog that could help, probably help my sister. Well, the cocker didn't, I promise you. <laughs> uh, 
So I got the cocker, and uh, which I wanted, of course. Well, I've stolen the cocker from my sister, to be honest, okay. my younger sister. I mean, I love her. Um, I never felt jealous about her or anything, but I had so much love for the dogs that uh, that happened naturally, really. Uh, I didn't intend to, to steal it. So I started doing some studying about something that would have a good temperament and surprise, surprise, an easy temperament. This beautiful dog that I had seen and actually existed um, um, had a wonderful temperament and all the English sheepdogs by definition, uh, by default I say, should have beautiful temperaments. So um, this is how I started with all the English sheepdogs. The first one, it was a rather traumatic experience. Um, I got it from um, a pet shop at the time. They were dogs, now it's illegal of course. There were dogs on sale, and um, this is how I got it. Uh, and then, um, uh, after I had a very disappointing experience there, which is not for, for now, I really got into in tune with uh, what is a pedigree dog and how one should get about it. I yeah. never thought about showing at that time in my life, I never thought about breeding. There was, you know, it wasn't at all in my list. But this is this is important. What you said by the bad experience that you had, you have learned. You know what is the point of pedigree dogs? Why it's important where you buy your dog? Why it's important to know who, who is the mother, who is the father, who bred the dog, where did it grow, and everything. I can understand completely that. Um, and and uh, strangely enough. Uh, I repeat it one million times in this show, strangely enough, um, I don't know how we cannot spread the easier this message, because this message is so easy, you know, how important it is to know where you buy a dog, who are his parents, what are his traumas from childhood and so on and so on, but doesn't matter. Uh, the, the, the changing point for you, Nicholas, from being just somebody who wants to have a nice, beautiful pet, pet at home, was actually when you went to the UK for studies. That's where you got involved. Well, that's how you got involved with the dog world, with the showing and everything. Uh, t tell me your first experience of a, of a dog show, uh, or or how did you get hooked on, on on this? I just arrived there by mistake. A friend down. Um, a friend said, "Oh, you like dogs so much. You know, there is a dog show, and I would like dog show. What is a dog show?" Exactly like that. Said, you know, I can drive you. I'm going up to London. I can drive you. I don't remember what show it was. Okay. It was raining. It was sometime in the summer. Okay. It was it's raining. Okay, that it was raining. <laughs> yeah, very strange. Yes, yes. It was, and I was left somewhere, you know, by a motorway in the south of um, of England. I believe it's it was Windsor. Okay. Uh, and then you know, I I find my way my way there, and I discover this amazing world. I just look around, and um, uh, I just spotted what I liked immediately. Immediately, I just did like that, and I spotted what like there was a blonde lady at the time uh, with uh, curly hair. It happens to be. Um, Christina Bailey, apparently, and okay. she had this beautiful bitch that looked and moved like nothing else. And um, and then uh, she wanted to break on the day. I I don't. I'm not sure what show it was. I believe it was Windsor. Um, it was um, uh, somebody who I found much later was called Ray Wilkinson. <laughs> Uh, because at the time I knew nobody and I knew nothing uh, about it. So, and then I started many years later, to, I started watching them and what they were doing. It was very difficult. Um, there was no internet at the time, as you know. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, it was really much more difficult. You had to study. It was all by letters uh, and all that. So I was hooked then. And I got my first um, 
better old English sheepdog. After I finished, um, after I was stabilizing Greece, it was of a quality then, and it became a champion too. Um, and uh, she was bred in Hungary. Uh, she didn't have the most wonderful pedigree, but she was a fantastic dog. And she was a good dog, good enough to be made up a champion under very good judges, may I say. Yeah. But, but the, somehow you say, um, in your CV, you say that, let's say, a changing point of everything, more or less, for you as a breeder, has happened in 2000. That See. was the, the moment when the stars have connected in the good position. And, and everything changed for you. T t tell me how and why. Okay, I'll have to tell you a little bit before that. Okay. Uh, to arrive to 2000. Now, very quickly, 2000 was uh, uh, Davos and Andreas, or Andreas and Davos, uh, Javor, a uh, litter um, that they bred these beautiful bits that I had seen. And I remembered so well that somebody called Carlos Ivic, no idea who this was at the, at the time, had put up somewhere in Scandinavia. Well, that was... Uh, but before that, um, all what I did in Old English, um, really, it's not related very much to Old English because I was fascinated with um, uh, snouters, giants. Okay. A few years, uh, a few years back, again, I found myself in a dog show, and surprise, surprise, a person called Andrew Brace was judging, and here there is a young bitch, uh, and I, I, you know, I, I used to pass by the giant snouters, look at them, but never look at them twice, and then there is this beautiful bitch, and then she goes in the ring, and then this strange person, Andrew Brace, who I knew not much about, he puts her up. That was Jaffra, Jaffra California Dreaming. And then I start following, um, obviously, uh, Francis and Jack uh, Krall, and um, I got a connection with uh, my biggest ever mentor in breeding. And uh, I know you make the questions, who do you miss? Well, Gina Saunders, Virginia Mary Saunders, I probably miss every day of my life. Um, and uh, I think I was so lucky. Um, Gina and her husband had moved to Paris from the UK, and I had a mentor uh, right there for me. And Gina taught me so much, and I got, she was friendly with Jack and Francis, crowd. So I had the opportunity to have a giant snouter, bitch. I don't know that you probably remember her at the time. Yeah, I have seen the photos, yes. Yeah, yeah, and uh, she was doing very well, and um, uh, beautiful well, actually, uh, at the time. And... Uh, she taught me, uh, Freeney, she was called, um, uh, and Gina more about dogs than uh, anybody else had ever um, uh, taught me before, and mostly about breeding. And then um, I have been watching what uh, Davor, uh, the rat as Kendall from uh, Croatia had, I had seen something of theirs, I believe in Italy. I'm not sure about that, but I believe in Italy, in Ancona. I don't remember where in Italy uh, at the time. And then I was like, wow, this is beautiful. And uh, of course, all their breeding went back to Christina's breeding, the Zotel's um, yeah. dogs that I was in love in England. And uh, surprise, surprise. A little bit of uh, Bobbington breeding, like Bobbington Latin Lover, uh, was in there, uh, so it was perfect. And of course, um, um, Gina said, when Davor was about to have his sea litter in 2000, uh, I said to Gina, I, I really feel I must get the dog from there. So you don't ask me, because I will tell you to go and get it immediately. And this is a great friend, friendship started because I'm always grateful and great friend of Davos. And, um, you know, and this is how I got Cosmo, Reatas Cosmopolitan. He was, uh, at his time, um, a record breaker. Surprisingly enough, uh, he had uh, the bitch I had liked back then, 
uh, on his pedigree, I suppose, four times. Um, and I thought he was, uh, well, you know, he was beautiful. He did, at his time, more than he broke all records. He was the first dog to win the World Show, uh, Crafts, uh, the European Show together. And yeah. I didn't show him that much. I never show dogs. Everybody thinks I show a lot, but actually I don't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, so and this, that was the turning point for you for breeding. Yeah, and then I decided with that wonderful dog, um, absolutely stunning. I mean, I don't know. I suppose he was fantastic. His movement was second to none. Uh, he wasn't almost an old English. He was going beyond that. And then I got a, a bitch with the help and support of um, Elizabeth Antle from Austria, who I'm sure you know. Uh, I got his cousin, and um, I hope she's listening because she's one of the people I really need to thank for whatever um, I've achieved. So, uh, yeah, I got uh, a bitch bred in Hungary, um, and uh, she was Fanfel qualified for happiness. And then I did my third Old English Sheepdog litter, my C litter, and that was um, a jackpot right from the very beginning. Wonderful. Um, listen, we will talk, of course, more about uh, Old English Sheepdogs. Um, I, I have some questions because, of course, there are people around, um, some people who are watching who are not involved with the breed and always like to learn something more. And then, of course, there are some breeders who are watching who like to hear your opinions on, on different things. Um, but before we start with the Old English, uh, let's just mention these few breeds that you have also been involved um, with in the past or now. Just quickly tell us your connections with that. We said about the Schnauzers, um, uh, about the Jaffra Beach that you had. Uh, what about the Norfolk Terriers? Oh, well, I was fascinated by them. I was very lucky. I was trying to get one. I mean, I still love them today. Um, I was trying to get uh, something from, um, you know, the top breeders. And um, I'm not mentioning name now, names now. And uh, I got um, a lovely uh, bitch, but she didn't have a wonderful mouth. So um, I bred her and um, and that went well, but not as well as I would love to. And I gave up, I think, um, uh, and it was a difficult time of my life. So, uh, excuse me, somebody's calling. So um, I gave up. Uh, I only had um, a couple of litters. Uh, one qualified for crafts, but not wonderful ones. What, what about carries? Oh, I, I love carries. I I remember your carry days. I still have carries. You still have? Okay. Absolutely. I have two living at home at the moment with me. One is 14. <laughs> and uh, and I have a young bitch that I really, really love. I think she's really nice. Uh, but uh, she's only became a champion. And uh, I, you see, I have a very busy life uh, outside dogs. So I... I don't make it to show dogs that much. So, and I'm uh, thinking of bringing her to what? And I've actually probably found a dog. Okay. <laughs> but how, how did the carries come to your life? All right. Um, now I have to... We were with um, my big brother, you know who this is, uh, somewhere in the States. And I believe we were in uh, the Yukanuba Invitational in, uh, when it was in California. And as we we're working about with Andrew, I see this beautiful carry on the table. And I go like, bang, I love that. Oh, he said, really, Andrew, do you really like that? I said, I love it, it's fantastic. Oh, it happens to be the top terrier in the States. If hey. you know. I said, but do you know the breeder? Uh, he said, of course I do. Here he picks up the phone, and this is when I, how I got my first carry. I didn't take the dog in order to have a show career, but he did have a wonderful show career. I actually had the dog as a gift for a friend who had a difficult 
uh, time in his life at the moment. And uh, I believe uh, this dog gave him uh, very much. And uh, I, on paper, I always owned him myself and showed him myself. And he did very well when he was shown. Also in Italy, he won groups over uh, top, top winning um, uh, Scottish Terriers at the moment, beautiful bitch. And, and I only one litter. <laughs> okay. Uh, and what about Griffons? All right. Griffons is... Um, now, Griffons, I, I've always liked. Um, and I've been uh, lucky enough to see some Mark and Griffons bring, you know, having these beautiful lines. You know, Griffons, they're not dogs. They're something like, they're something between dogs and cats. Yeah. They sleep over here. You know what they do at home? They sleep on the bobtails. They really do. I probably shouldn't say bobtails because uh, uh, it's uh, on the now, old. Now I'm all the time using old English sheep dog. <laughs> uh, uh, I had an interview uh, recently, a question. So, how do you feel about tails? And I said, I'm not good like this one. <laughs> okay, I will try also. Anyhow. <laughs> Uh, so Griffons you still have or not anymore? Of course, absolutely. We okay. have a lovely, lovely dog that I was crying this year uh, that I, uh, I wasn't able to show under uh, Stephen Seymour. I mean, I was, I mean, he's a lovely, we have a lovely dog at home, honestly. And uh, again, he's a pet. <laughs> he lives as a pet. All our dogs live as, uh, lives as pets. And um, to us, showing, uh, it's the icing of the cake, really. Yeah. It's not, uh, you know. Priority. Yeah. Okay, then before the story of the, of the old English, uh, we must mention Chihuahuas. All I don't right. think many people know that you, you bred some litters in Chihuahuas also. Uh, in two hours, I've bred quite a few litters. Yes, um, this, is, this was a surprise also for me. <laughs> yes, uh, I keep it a little bit private. Um, now, it was at Crafts one year, many, many years ago, I suppose uh, around 93, 94. And um, I heard the speaker saying, uh, now this is uh, the toy group. And they are not working dogs, and they are companions of uh, humans. So that must be an important work. And I was uh, very lucky in my life to experience how wonderful these dogs can be. I love two hours, um, and um, I breed them in a very low scale. I have a very dear friend in Greece, and um, I mean she's very well known because. Her mother is a former president of the Greek Kennel Club. And um, Christina had some troubled, um, um, well, teenage with health issues. And um, Bula Bautanis was clever enough to go all the way to uh, the UK and get for Christina uh, a beautiful Chihuahua. Malibrook lines. Antonia was uh, Wanda, she, she it was her pet name, and uh, the good she did for Christina, I don't know what working dog has done in its life. Yes. So I have uh, so much respect for two hours that, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but this is this is one of the things that we uh, also maybe don't, don't mention often, but uh, you have uh, you have said it three times already uh, for three different persons how dogs have been extremely important for them in difficult parts of their life. And this is maybe the, the most amazing role of the dog, you know, to, to I think as a breeder, you will know it sometimes, you know, you get this phone call and people say, you know, this dog has changed my life. So I think this is the, the nicest thing you can hear as a, as a breeder. Uh, okay, let's go now to the bobtails. Uh, I start like this. People will say, many people will say, many old breed judges will say when you talk to them, uh, they will say, I find bobtails very difficult to judge. Why, why is that so? What is so, uh, so difficult about bobtails? Nothing. 
I'm sorry. I just don't <laughs> get it. <laughs> Nothing. Uh, I really find they're a very easy breed. And uh, if you only think a little bit, why? If you get somebody, I mean, it's so, uh, okay. It's not a breed that you can judge without hands-on. It's not, you know, uh, it's not a greyhound, yeah. um, for God's sake. Uh, I understand that, but the Pekingese is it's the same, uh, yeah. as difficult. So, you know, coated breeds, you have to go with hands-on and feel what's under the coat. Because some groomers and some handlers can be wonderful in actually totally changing the real structure of the dog. But the old English is a very basic breed, as long as you understand a few things. It's got to be compact. Okay. Why? And it's got to have this characteristic top line. And the minute you get that, the top line comes from the loin. It's the strength of the loin. You don't expect, it's a slight rise. You don't expect anything like that, really. So the minute you understand why this is done, you have a little bit longer rear legs, really. And immediately you understand, you can understand that this dog, like a hare, cannot go downhill very quickly because of this top line. It has a peculiar movement. It's got to be elastic and rhythmical. And this is all about it, really. I feel everything else. And then if they're so, if they're compact, they don't have all that room under their body to move these legs. Um, uh, and this is it. And the minute you see it, you realize they've got to be rhythmical and elastic with obviously a very good drive and very good reach. But of course, movement comes from the rear. It does come from the, from, uh, the front assembly of the dog, which is a problem nowadays. But anyway, and um, I think you've got to have a square capacious head. I mean, it's got, it is, it is a working breed. You need some brain and you need a big head. You need a square head, which is very easy, and a compact dog. And then you, you really need, you know, the basic structure. Just remember compact with a little bit of the, of the a rising top line. And of course, then go for coat. Okay. Coat is important. I mean, you see all these people exaggerating today so much with the work of looking after the coats. If you have a correct quality coat, you don't need to do all that so much work. They seem so difficult. They shouldn't really be that difficult. Yeah, okay. There, there are some things that are different, like this rising top line and this. But, uh, of course, as you said, if you understand why and how, um, it, it should not be so difficult. Um, when you talk about the bobtails of today, um, you look at the bobtails of today, um, what would you say at that at the moment is maybe the biggest problem of the breed? I think um, I would instantly say fronts, okay. but, but I want to say numbers. Okay. I believe the biggest issue is numbers. The numbers are dropping so much, um, and this is very bad, but it's not old English only, it's so many breeds. I believe that um, uh, we find across uh, every breed, or most of the breeds today. So that makes it difficult to go on. Then I find the most difficult thing is France. I'm sorry for our American friends, but um, you know this fashion of very exaggerated rear and this you know upstanding France. It's not really functioning for, um, definitely not for our breed, well, for most breeds. But anyway, um, then there are a few other issues. I think uh, depth of body is an issue nowadays. Um, another issue I find is temperaments. Um, that I find difficult. Um, when I go around and as a breeder, you need to search always for, you know, uh, something new. Um, temperaments are difficult. And another funny thing, I find they're missing uh, under Joe, a lot of them. Okay. Uh, when, you, when you talk about temperament, what, what exactly you see the, the problem? What kind of problems with temperament? Because we all know both things as, uh, you know, like happy, uh, always happy dogs. Are they starting to be sh too much shy or they're starting to be a little bit aggressive? 
aggressiveness personally i've only experienced with that with one dog many years ago in greece um uh, that uh, it definitely wasn't a good breeding or anything like that i have not seen aggressiveness i have not experienced aggressiveness okay i've heard of some uh, a very good friend and a very good judge had a dog actually going for him a few years back so i've heard of it um they can be you know what is the problem they they're not the most reliable dog they should be an old english sheep dog should be reliable yeah. really reliable i mean you realize how i got introduced to them and how reliable they needed to be for for that work and then if you have a dog working around sheep driving them they had to be reliable um, so yeah uh, uh one of the things that are that are different when you are judging bobtails uh, comparing to most of the other breeds um maybe in a way similar a little bit like um, to philas uh, many times judges ask you when you are going up and down to do this like slow rolling and then to do a, a, a normal uh, normal movement why why is that is that something very special for the breed or, or why is that yeah it is something very special to the uh, very specific to the breed um uh, they need to have a wider rear and then when going slowly they may pace it's actually written in the standard in the standard but then you can see these rolling bear like movements if they have it you don't really need to start searching that much of this rising top line it's there okay many many judges uh, say that you don't really need to touch too much the dog i believe in that actually too much searching means you know you probably don't know what you're doing and um, okay. i find it a bit pretentious sometimes yeah yeah okay tell me now um uh, uh, when we talk about about the movement uh, this this first part of the movement should be like slow and and going from one side to another but then this other movement you said it needs to be completely something else but uh, uh, I think one of the things that people don't understand about herding breeds is this head carriage uh, how important is the head carriage when you are moving the dogs because I see some people you know trying to push these heads up 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 which is completely untypical for the for the not only for this breed but for most of the breeds from from this group well um so starting from head carriage, which is the last thing you said, um, a natural lower position when a dog is moving forward is something that everybody can understand. I mean, one thing is a natural lower position. Another thing is grazing like a sheep to the floor. Okay. They are so different. I mean, and then if you see a dog going downwards, one it should be going, you know, ahead. And moving, you know, there's a problem in the front there. I suppose. Yeah. And I mean, and that's not so specific for old English. Um, we the rolling with old English um, have had uh, has had uh, an impact uh, for years in the breed. Um, and you know, yes, they have to have the rolling, but the front and the rear during the movement, they should be connected to produce this powerful, elastic, forward-going movement with drive, if you see what I mean. Yeah, absolutely. I absolutely. hope I'm being clear in that because... Uh, very, very clear. <laughs> I've very heard clear. people saying, oh, this dog has to have a lower head position. And then the other thing I personally don't like at all, and uh, again, excuse our American friends, is this handling these dogs with these very tight leads and they have to keep their heads up as if i don't know where they're going okay. I, i'm sorry i i really like to see a dog moving on a loose lead and see what can it do i know if somebody's string a dog up or is hiding something <laughs> or there's a problem there or he doesn't know what he's doing i mean in my eyes i would always ask to lose the lead to loosen the lead yeah. Okay, uh, I I think with the, you know with puppies and these things you need to have you help them a little bit. But with the adult dog, um, so many times you can see a dog and you say a loose lead 
and suddenly everything goes, you know, to pieces and changes the whole picture. Yeah. Uh, tell me, um, uh, Nicholas, when we are talking, you said you 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 said to somebody you don't want to um, answer about that, but you know the, the breed originally, or I don't know if originally, but a part of the breed is bobtail, which means it should not have a tail. Uh, suddenly now it has a tail. Do you do you find in your breeding often or ever that they are born completely without the tail, or where did the name come from, and what about these tails <laughs> and bobtails? Okay, do you want me to pol to be politically correct or be myself? No, I want you to be honest. I want you to be honest. All right, I don't get it. Um, how a bobtail could ever have a tail? <laughs> Okay. Uh, the breed I fell in, I fell in love with um, didn't have a tail, and that goes for so many of us. And as far as I'm concerned, I have been uh, criticized so much because at some point um, I showed a dog, an old English sheepdog with a tail in the States. It wasn't my choice. I was invited to do that. And uh, I did it, and I was so criticized. See, I was criticized so much as if I was promoting tales. I, I mean, of all people in the universe, <laughs> me, who doesn't like tales at all. Uh, I'll say about that that uh, as I told you earlier, I had um, I have a wonderful friend, Bet, who used to live, you know, down uh, down the road. And I had never experienced a dog myself suffering for being dog. I've heard it. I've never seen it. Yeah. So what can I say? And then, you know, um, probably what I'm saying I must, is... I must, I must say, this is not a secret everybody knows because I, I'm... I'm never politically correct. I always say what I mean, and I'm always honest about my opinions. Um, I love to see cropped and dog dogs in many breeds. And I must say, of course, uh, you know, I breed now miniature schnauzers for um, for so many years, and they are all, uh, you know, natural with tails and ears and everything. And they don't bother me so much, and it, they never bothered me. I have very easily got used to the picture of uncropped and undocked miniature schnauzer. But I, I have really, really struggled with the bobtails with tail. Because, you know, okay. you, have, you have this perfect picture, you know, you have all this, you know, all this uh, sculpture, and then it starts to move, and suddenly there is this thing coming somehow. So I, it was one of the breeds that really took me a long time to accept them. But now, now I'm okay with it. But it is... I have a question for you, which actually, uh, I mean, um, you should be doing the questions, but really, the bitch um, who won the uh, the group at Crafts and Reserve Best in Show three weeks ago, did you were you bothered by her tail? No, no. But the, I can understand. I can understand um, in the breeds, you know, which has been which have been cropped and dogged for so many years. It's wonderful when you get a nice tail. It's the same with the mini schnauzers. It's wonderful when you get the puppy which has beautiful tail and ears. But if you get horrible tail and horrible ears, it changes everything. So it is one of these things. Anyhow, um, I want to ask you uh, another another uh, question where I don't want you to be uh, politically correct, but honest. Uh, another thing discussed a lot with the bobtails is this grooming. You know. Uh, what what should be done? What should not be done? What is for you enough? What is for you too much? Uh, you know, are you using a little bit of spray, a little bit of powder? Are you against it? Uh, uh, tell me, tell me what is for you something that that for you is a well groomed old English sheepdog. Okay, I will start with my principles about okay. part of it. And um, when you go out there and you have good dogs, and you want to win, you want to be an ambassador of your breed. Of your breed. You want to go in the breed ring and in the main ring and show something beautiful, really beautiful. Now, where beauty stops and exaggeration begins, uh, I mean, the exaggeration we see 
lately is another issue. Now, I do whatever I can. You personally have seen me grooming and everybody, I suppose. So, with, uh, with, the, with the picture, <laughs> I remember the picture. <laughs> that, ah, you know about that picture. Yes, because you remember I have asked you, but why they're showing you a picture like you don't have, and, and the lady said, no, it must be grouped exactly like she was grouped when she won the best in show, I don't know where. So, that tell was. That was a picture from Best in Show um, from, uh, by Stuart Mallard. Uh, he had done this beautiful book about old English sheepdogs. And, uh, uh, you know, he was um, one of the people who, who almost changed the breed a little bit in the UK. So that was his painting about his ideal old English sheepdog, not overdone. And uh, I was trying to not, we were trying with Matteo, obviously, to not overdo it. Yeah, and yeah. that was there, it was actually... Uh, very clever, I must say, very clever. And, uh, well, we didn't beat you, though. <laughs> yeah, okay, but... <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, yeah, now, uh, these sculptured things, um, that they go out there and they look like uh, gigantic uh, visions, I'm sorry, I don't like. I've been accused for over-grooming myself uh, okay. from quite a few people. Uh, I probably overdone it at some point, and, but, I, but I think, you know, as handlers, breeders, we go through phases. Um, I think um, what it was shown this year at Crafts and what was the dog that won Pegasus, who won Crafts um, 2017 or 18, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, it is under Mr. Robin Newhouse. I believe this is, uh, I, I, if everybody, if anybody sees it, he will know exactly, exactly what I like. I wouldn't like a dirty dog to go in the ring, for God's sake. I wouldn't like an ungroomed dog. I would like a very well-groomed dog, but it should look somehow natural. Really. Okay. okay. And you are not you are not uh, against this against choke against powder against hair spray against everything. No, I'm not. Um, okay. What I say, what I mean, I'm not. Um, I mean, I would never go and touch a dog and feel there is uh, things about it. But how would you ever? And this goes beyond all the English dogs. How would you ever see a poodle looking as beautiful as they do yeah. with uh, some little bit of something? I'm not talking about exaggerations. Yeah, yeah, no, of course. We are not talking about overgrooming. We are going, we are. Yeah. We but are really, about, yeah. Uh, and that was because we uh, had a seminar last year at the Euro OES about grooming. And I said all these things. I mean, we need to go out there of, like um, ambassadors of our breed. Yeah. And we need to be, you know, the custodians of that breed. How do you do it? You can never do it with too much hairspray, too much powder. Okay. You have to go, you know, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but I, you know, in, in one way, in one way, this this is what you say. You know, to find this balance before between, you know being dirty or unbrushed and between being overgrown. Uh, there is an interesting uh, uh, comment from uh, Gerardo Paolucci. He says they need a grooming, but the natural grooming look needs more time and talent. I think this is very, very, very true, not only for the old English, but for so many Brits. Oh. Uh, you know, it's so anyhow. Uh, I want to ask you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask you, Nicolas, uh, your your uh, affair with the with the old English started in 1981. Then you had these dogs in 1993. Then 2000 was let's say a changing year. But this is more or less we are talking about 40 years uh, of you being connected with the breed with one way or another. I'm sorry. <laughs> say that. I'm I sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just a fact. Uh, I want to ask you when you think now about these 40 years. When you think about your dogs from 1993, or when you think about your dogs in 2000, and when you think about, let's say, Blondie now, did the breed change in this period of time? 
And if yes, in what? Did it change only the way of showing and grooming? Or you also think there have been changes more or less in type? Okay. Um, the, I believe there have been changes. And may I say, I'm very positive about the breed. Okay. This is the first thing I want to say. I hear people so many often, and some of them, some of them are very good friends of mine, and people who I respect a lot. And they say, oh, past times, it was this, it was that. You know, in the past, they were huge, the numbers, and they were wonderful dogs. I agree, but, uh, you know, um, the best per perfumes may come in also in smaller bottles, we say in Greek. So, um, I believe there are some wonderful dogs out there today. I see people around the world, and uh, I see some of them, I wouldn't want to say names uh, here, but there are some people out there doing a wonderful job. And if we work together, and if we, you know, can overcome our ego, really, I think it would be wonderful for the breed. Um, there, have been, there have been some wonderful dogs in the past. I mean, I already uh, mentioned um, a couple, I suppose, I mean, you know, who could see a Bobbiton Latin lover and not fall over at the time? Or um, a Boise flamboyant, or, you know, there was this wonderful, or Miss Marple, the same, Missy, um, Christina's, uh, Christina Bailey's dogs, these are. There were some amazing dogs out there in the past, and the numbers were wonderful. The breed is changing a little bit um, within the breed standard i want to you know i i, I believe it is and um, but i still see some wonderful dogs uh, i found myself at the centennial um at the centennial show um a week before craft as i said and i found myself saying to people i like your dog and i like your dog and i really like your dog okay so, um, I think there is a lot of hope, as long as uh, what there isn't, we don't have enough breeders. Yeah. And uh, This is a problem in many breeds, not just in all the English, yeah. And, uh, and you know, everybody who gets involved in the breed, they want only one thing. They want to win. Yeah. <laughs> they want to be, you know, wonderful handlers, wonderful groomers and everything, but they don't know how much it takes, uh, what, it, what there is behind, how much one has to study, and uh, this is the thing. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Um, tell me, um, I, I don't ask me to repeat it, uh, what it was actually, but I'm curious if you have the same, uh, same opinion and you will for sure uh, know what I'm talking about. I usually ask people, uh, you know, what do you think about the FCI standard of the breed? Do you think it's good? Do you think something should be better explained? Do you think something should be changed? I remember when Davor was my guest, he was mentioning something about the color, if I'm, if I'm not wrong. Um, is that something that is bothering you or, or you have some other problems with the standard or standard is perfect for you? Perfect is nothing, but um, I believe that um, I don't really have problems with the standard. I have been, um, and I actually uh, find it uh, very uh, interesting that the American standard is so much a little bit different than the European and the UK one. So, um, no, um, I wouldn't change anything in the standard, to be honest. And okay. this, if this is the breed I, um, I don't know, I probably... Um, I don't feel I am, you know, of significance enough to have an opinion about that, to change the standards, to be honest. Okay, uh, okay fair I, enough. Uh, yeah, last, last question about, about the Old English for the moment, uh, help. This is a topic number one in many breeds at the moment. Are the Old English uh, healthy breed? And if not, or, uh, you know, are there some things that at the moment, you know, should be better looked at and, and, uh, and, and take care of? No, they're healthy. They're, generally speaking, they're very, very, very healthy. The one problem, the number one problem is um, cancer, really. And uh, it appears to be mostly in the States for some reason. Don't, I, I don't know why. Some people say 
uh, vaccines. Some people say that. I, I would probably prefer to say that our dogs don't live a very natural life anymore. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I don't believe that the dog is uh, obviously a creature of nature because it isn't. It's, it's human made. It was made by humans. It was, you know, bred uh, by ourselves. Uh, but uh, I think, and I believe we have a lot of tools today. Although the veterinary medicine, you know, when I was a child, my first dream was to become a veterinarian. I don't think uh, many people know that. And Mateus was the same, apparently. And um, <laughs> yeah, uh, but I think uh, it can be a little bit overdone. The you know the basic stockman's knowledge and understanding about uh, breeds it seems to be going down, and everything seems to be. A result of a laboratory. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's go, Nicholas, now to some of these quick questions. Um, these are usually the ones that people love to hear because they are a little bit more personal um, in many ways. Uh, let's see how you are going to deal with that. We, you will know more or less the questions that I ask normally, so I'm sure you are quite prepared. But let's let's see where where it's going to bring us. Um, I know you spend a lot of time in Italy, but you're originally Greek. So I will start with what, what is your favorite dog show in Greece? My favorite dog show in Greece? Well, suppose uh, the Athens show um, that used to take place in Marathon. Now it's changing this year. I invite everybody to come <laughs> okay. by the way for the Greek club. But I love going to the shows of, uh, you know, uh, the countryside. I love it because I think supporting the sport there is very important. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can I can say from my um, from my own experience. I have been many times in Greece showing. Um, it is uh, okay if we put on one side, you know, the the dog shows which are very well organized, always with top judges and very nice hospitality, and usually, you know, everything is how it should be. But Greece as itself, if we talk about people, atmosphere, food, is like amazing, you know. So uh, I can I can say from that point of view, you know, if you have a possibility to fool somebody that you are going just for a dog show to Greece, do it because you will not be sorry about about the experience. Uh, tell me, uh, Nicholas, uh, what would be your favorite old English sheepdog from the past? or from the present, doesn't matter, not bred or owned by you? Well, um, there was a uh, past or present. You want one? Because I don't know. Say whatever you like. Well, you know, um, I based all my breeding and all the English sheepdog careers for the, from this turning point that you said on some specific dogs. Obviously, I've always liked them. That was... Uh, and the people who had them, uh, I will speak again about, and I will be boring, Bobby Gunlack and Lover of Alex Little. Uh, I mean, such a fantastic, always presented to perfection. Um, Christina Bailey's dogs, they were wonderful. And then the pocket hole dogs of um, uh, the Wilkinson, they were, uh, to me, the basis of what came next. Some wonderful Bringley dogs. And what have you? A wonderful American dog, the Jilly Bennett, wonderful Jilly Bennett, that made me uh, made my dog win for the first ever time crafts. Uh, she put up a fantastic dog in the U.S. I've never seen in real life, but he was uh, my dream. Pop tops, good loving. He was cold. Um, some wonderful dogs, and lately there was uh, a beautiful dog. I cannot remember the name. Uh, of the Bugabu Kennel uh, in the state that won the national. And um, I'm terrible with names, as I said, I'm sorry. Same, the same like me. Uh, tell me, uh, this is always a difficult question, but what should be, in your opinion, the best dog that you ever bred? Oh my God. That is a very difficult question. Um, I'm involved with the Blondies, Delia's breeding, obviously because uh, whatever I've done in the last 12 years, it's always done with Matteo, so maybe Pegasus is called Ariakas, but uh, 
uh, his as much his effort and blood is um, is also my effort. So uh, well, she's one. Let's, let's let's mention one Ariakas. One Ariakas. Um, I have to say that the dog that um, uh, always brings tears in my eyes is Cosmo Junior, Ariakas okay. Cosmo Junior, and. Um, I'm ever so grateful to Elizabeth for what she did uh, for him and for me. Um, but uh, then I must say Stefania, who I adore. Uh, she's still alive, she's a bit older. Um, there are so many dogs. Of course, Pegasus is such an impressive dog. He only did 19 shows in his life. All his career, he, he did 19 shows exactly. Um, I have some wonderful, wonderful dogs to think. It's very difficult to say yeah. one or the other. Of course, yeah. Uh, tell me, uh, of course, uh, you have many times, you know, been involved as a breeder watching your dogs being shown by somebody else. But I want to know one, one situation when you were a handler, when you were going to the ring, one win which you will never forget in your life. Something that always stays in your mind as, let's say, the most special win of your life. I really don't have luck today with anything, even with the light. <laughs> okay. Um, well, many, but um, I really want to speak about uh, Davor and Andrea again, the Reatas from Croatia, from your country, because they are so much, you know, they have so much um, influence. The great win was. Uh, one year, Cosmo won over a dog, a fantastic dog, that Davor was showing himself. So I beat him with the dog that he bred under, um, at the European show in Tulln, I believe. Uh, I don't remember what year. Um, and it was a fantastic win because Cosmo was a very excitable dog in the ring. The minute he heard the clapping, he was sure everything was about him. It was for him. So that was, and of course, the first time I won crafts. That was uh, that was again with Cosmo. I mean, he won it, I didn't. Under Jilly Bennett, it was such an experience because um, I was very ill before that show, um, and I had a very difficult period with my health. And my friend Gina, who I mentioned before, and a big member, she, she I told her, if I get out of this run, you have to take me to crafts, with or without Cosmo, because I really was very bad in hospital at that time. And she actually did, and he won crafts. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, this is, this is you know, some, some things that we never forget. Um, I, I know the feeling because, you know, sometimes you have these people in your life, you know, who are special for you, and when you beat them, you know, with their own dog, actually, it, it gives a special special feeling. Um, tell me, uh, is there one breed that you never had and you would like to have one day? One, many. <laughs> well, let's say which one is on the top. Andrew Brace calls me a puppy farmer. You know that? <laughs> so, so nice of him. <laughs> okay, uh, well, when I will grow older, because I'm still very young, I want to have Pekingese. Okay. But before that, I want to have smooth fox terriers. Okay. <laughs> okay. Just to give you an idea, but uh, you know, there's some lovely pointers <laughs> out. About the diversity <laughs> of your choices. Uh, okay. <laughs> Tell me, uh, this is always a difficult question because there are so many talented breeders all around the world. But when you talk, uh, think about breeders in Greece. Um, who is one breeder that you think does amazing job uh, in Greece with, with breeding? Well, uh, for the size of the country we are, we have some very good breeders and they actually try a lot. Um, but I must say um, uh, very quickly, and uh, I actually thought of that before, uh, because that would be a very difficult question. Vasilis Kunelas with the Doberwans. Okay. He's doing um, what he's been doing for so many years, and it is duration that matters to me here, and being still out there, and then 
but we have some wonderful people like Claude and Poppy Audrey with the GSPs that I love. They're wonderful people and they've had wonderful dogs over the years. Um, I must say that um, she's very friendly. She's a very good friend, uh, but she has some wonderful dogs. Again, doesn't show very, very much. And I'm not being biased here. I'm being honest. Faye with the pugs, Faye Kefalai with the best of red spikes. I mean, she doesn't show them that much. And another, um, uh, which is very much of my kind, is Alexia with the Golden Retrievers and Labradors. Okay. She has wonderful dogs of her own. Again, she doesn't show as much as I would like her to, but you know. Uh, tell me, tell me, when you think about big breeders outside of Greece, maybe somebody who is in your eyes idol for you, somebody that you know you think about. Okay, this is for me the best breeder of all times. Uh, any breed, who would you mention? But I think um, very quickly, Michael, Michael Gatsby. Okay. Easily, quickly like that. And the Wilberts, for God's sake. Okay, wonderful. Okay, yeah. uh, tell me tell me, uh, three judges whose opinion about your dogs is extremely important for you. Okay. <laughs> um, when I start with these questions, everybody is like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. I must say, uh, there are not only three, there are many. But uh, one of the judges I personally adore, and uh, now that he stopped judging, he can also be a very good friend, is Carlos Ayrich. Okay. Argentina. Um, I really believe he's one of the world's top class judges. Did, did he stop, did he stop judging, Carlos? Uh, I li yeah, I'm not going to meet him myself personally in any ring. and. Okay. Uh, Somebody, so I can now be, you know, uh, uh, more open with him. And I, I value his opinion and his passion about so many breeds and his understanding. Uh, and um, not then, I must say that I admire so much Andrew Brace. Um, now, I don't even know that I'm objective with Andrew, but Andrew is uh, one of my mentors. I owe him so much. And um, um, whenever I see him judging, uh, and I watch him judging, he watched, he judged the Bikini show this last yeah. Sunday. And uh, Sandra, if she's here, thank you, Sandra, you are, you are priceless. She recorded all this and she sent me all these videos. I mean, uh, when I watch Andrew judging, I just love it. I love it. And, uh, and I find him so very interesting. And uh, so, you know, uh, so I have to come up with one more now. One more, yes. But we can stop also with these ones. I'm trying to fix this horrible light, which is making me problems on the day to day. I don't know what is happening. I don't know. Wonderful people make, here. With all the all the problems that are happening now to make a balance in my life after this best in show at crafts, you know, <laughs> so that I don't start to think that everything in life is so nice and so wonderful. But anyhow, um, no, we are fine with two. Of course, I, you know, you mentioned Andrew. Um, Andrew has been uh, inspiration for so many people. And he's one of these people um, that is so passionate about dogs. And uh, and you can speak with him about anything, you know. And and he is uh, he has so much more experience, uh, for example, than myself. I can tell just say about my own experience with Andrew. But he is never full of himself. He's always there, you know, to respect also your opinion, to listen to you, what you have to say. I mean, he's he is absolutely priceless. No doubts about that. Um, I'm giving you, Nicholas, now the possibility. Um, uh, this is something that maybe um, we don't have opportunity to do so much, uh, but we all owe to some people what we are today. Um, and sometimes it's nice to be able to say it out loud, you know, these are the people who helped me to become what I am today. Who are these people who have helped you to, to be what you are today in the world of dogs? Okay. Um, obviously, I spoke about my grandfather, and uh, I want to say that again. 
definitely Gina, uh, probably more than anyone else as far as breeding is concerned. Um, because she had so much um, earthy understanding of dogs and animals of all kinds because uh, she also used to have horses, so uh, they die and all sorts of life. So, so she, Gina helped me so much. Um, and I cannot start. I, I, I've said some, or I wrote actually, some years ago, every book is written for another book. Uh, there are so many people. I could never thank enough Helen Harris, my dearest uh, adopted. I adopted her, UK mom. <laughs> um, our friendship has been going on for something uh, like 20 years, and uh, you know, uh, we're still there together. Uh, there are so many. Elizabeth, for God, I mean, Elizabeth Antle. I spoke about Elizabeth before. We're not that close these days, uh, but, um, you know, the UK breed standard has CJ's drawing, drawing today for so many years. I mean, who could imagine that a guy, a dog born on Virus Island in Greece would ever be, you know, uh, the breed symbol in uh, the UK. Um, so uh, I, I, I really, I thought I would have the time to write down the so <laughs> Names for not to forget. Uh, there are so many people, you know. Um, I know. Obviously, I must say about Matteo's input in my life uh, for the last uh, 12 years. Uh, but mostly, all these people who have these dogs, because we don't keep that many dogs at home with us. If it wasn't for Luisa, for Dimitris, who keep these dogs in this, you know, tip-top condition. Um, living the life they do. I don't know. But the thing is, I want to also thank so many people who had been a great inspiration for me. I spoken about uh, Christina Bailey earlier, Alex Little, um, the pocket holes, definitely. Uh, probably, um, you know, uh, reading the breed notes of Barry Croft, uh, to me, it was always, you know, I would keep them, and I still have them, apparently. There were some judges who used to write some wonderful critics. Yeah, um, Some more than the others, you know, I find, you know, good this, good that, good the other, a little bit boring. Yeah. If you know what I mean. And uh, if you are, you know, a passionate breed person, you really need this something extra. Uh, and these people, uh, Jilly Bennett, um, I must say she's been very inspirational uh, for me. So, um, how could I ever thank Davor and Andrea uh, from Croatia? Uh, I would be forever grateful. Uh, so many people, people in Germany. Um, um, Andrea and Gerald Zemmerhold, who helped me. Some people from the States who actually let me use their dogs. Sally yeah. Beretta, um, so of many. Course. So many people that, that have helped us in this way or another. Um, tell me, tell me, Nicolas, um, in your head as a breeder, when you're thinking about the next generations, what is something that you would like to improve in your dogs? Now I'm going through a phase. <laughs> okay. Phases, you know, um, and when you feel, I don't know how how other people go about it and how they experience it, but uh, I believe um, I'm going through phases. Okay. Now it's uh, uh, strong, strong bodies and uh, uh, more bear-like dogs, really if you ask me. And the thing I would like to stabilize a lot more, uh, really, uh, I would like to have uh, even better temperaments. Okay. My side. Okay. Tell me, uh, last of the quick questions, uh, quickly, uh, you live on a relation between Italy and Greece. Uh, three things that are better in Greece than in Italy, and three things that are better in Italy than in Greece. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, the lifestyle of Greece is unbeatable. Okay. Uh, I'm very well traveled, as you know. Uh, that 
you cannot fix. You don't find it. Um, the nightlife in Greece is definitely fantastic. Uh, and and that I don't think you can beat easily. And, and of course, the sea in Greece is unbeatable. Uh, I'm very spoiled, um, really very spoiled. There is no way I can be convinced, you know, easily by that. Now, Italy. Italy, I would, I would say food, although I love Greek food. That is very difficult, yeah. That is very difficult to say which food is better, Italian or Greek, but okay. Um, I would have to choose, I mean, if it is for fish, I would choose uh, the Greek food. But uh, no, yeah, the food in Italy is fantastic. You go to some little villages and you find some, find some wonderful little restaurants. Um, the country is such a beautiful country. It has everything from, you know, Sicily all the way to the Alps. Wonderful. And the way they're, uh, you know, um, they preserve some cities, not where we live. I have to say that I am from Greece, but I went to Magna Grecia. You know what this is? No. Okay. The, um, the Athenian, the golden times of Athens, times of Pericles, they used to speak about the big Greece that was the southern of Italy, Magna oh. Grecia. <laughs> okay. And all the wealth used to come from there. Wonderful. Okay. I for the promotion. <laughs> well, okay, let's talk, uh, Nicholas, now um, a little bit about breeding. Um, when you are thinking about your next generations, um, how do you decide, you know, which male you are going to use or which female? Um, did you have good experiences without crossing or you have uh, done most of it in line breeding? Uh, how important is the pedigree for you? Would you ever use a dog which you particularly don't like, but you like the pedigree? Tell me a little bit about your breeding strategy. Okay. Um, my breeding strategy is in a few words. I outcross to line breed. <laughs> okay. Very, I mean, line breeding to me is uh, the key of breeding, really, uh, somehow. But of course, you have to outcross uh, to do that. Um, I believe in females. I believe somebody who wants to breed good dogs needs to have and keep the best females possible. This is where um, you can actually see um, uh, and you can go on and plan from there. Um, if I have to do, I mean, in my career, people think I've made too many litters or so many litters. I actually haven't very few. Um, uh, I think uh, a mating for me in a breeding, to do it, it has to be exciting. Okay. It's not exciting, I don't do it. And I like to go to, you know, I have a, a very busy life outside of dog showing and breeding anyway. So um, if, if I've got to do something, it's got to be worth it. But if I go to use a dog, I say always, it has to have a very good mother. I may compromise for, for a stud dog. And I have used some stud dogs that were not up to my, you know, expectations. expectations. Uh, but uh, they have to have... Uh, that I've stolen many years ago from uh, Pat Trotter, really. So, um, Patricia Trotter, I'm sure everybody knows who, who she is. Um, I really believe in line breeding, and you have to have the stock uh, to do it. You have to have the beautiful animals to do it, and um, yeah. And and what what about picking up the puppy? When you decide that you want to keep a puppy, when do you decide, you know, which one you will keep, and what is actually that you want to see in this puppy? Okay, that is the very difficult question because. Uh, uh, Matteo wants to keep everything, apparently. Okay. <laughs> we have a puppy now that we need to keep again. <laughs> I'm joking, but anyway. Um, I always see puppies um, when they're wet. Okay. I have an idea about them almost uh, very quickly. I do know what I like because I know why I did the breeding to start with. Okay. So. 
if we're talking about dogs from, uh, you know, what there is our blood bloodlines, I can actually see what I want if it is there, if not very quickly, uh, if we're talking about confirmation. And then I wait up to six, about se sorry, seven weeks to see the things there. Of course, you have to t test, but uh, when you need to, you need to have two uh, and all that. Testicles I'm talking about <laughs> and teeth and that. <laughs> Uh, I thought you you didn't get it and uh, yeah. and all that, but uh, really, what you get if you see something, if you see a puppy that is wet and it's born and it is what you expect from that breeding. Then it is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, there are these things that are coming later, but yeah, that's and, the first. Uh, uh, pedigrees are extremely important, extremely important, but. I'm not a only pedigree uh, person. It has to be the dog as well. Okay. I mean, if I have a terrible dog with a wonderful pedigree, I wouldn't take it. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, tell me, tell me, uh, Nicholas. I'm sure they are asking you that many times. Do you want to be a judge one day? <laughs> Well, I'm, um, I'm starting my path uh, for becoming, I've started, yes, uh, for becoming a judge. The day after tomorrow, I'm judging an open show in England. Okay. And uh, yes, uh, yes, I want for old English. I feel uh, very confident. I'm not, I don't know that I'm going to go uh, faster about it and do many breeds. I really don't know. Um, everybody, including Andrew, uh, they're kind of pushing me towards this direction. But I don't know that I actually have the guts and the knowledge and the experience to do it. Old English, I feel very um, comfortable with. I know exactly what I want and uh, what I like. I and think I, this is this is one of these discussions um, which are happening also quite often here in Talking Dogs with Dante. Um, I, I, I think many times, you know, people sometimes, you know, they go in the ring and they judge whatever and the big entry or whatever, and they feel okay with this. Me, I'm completely different. Uh, me, I would, for example, never be okay with myself to go now um, to judge a big entry of the breed, which I'm not comfortable with in a, in a way that I don't know what I want to see. And and uh, I, I have, I'm like, you know, enormously grateful to my kennel club that they have let me not you know like people normally do you do now one group and then you will do another group and then you do the third group but to let me do the breeds which i really love which i really and, and it's so amazing you know uh, now i'm becoming like international judge so i can finally start to judge outside and people are inviting me and they say which breed would you like to judge and i say any of the breeds which i can judge because i judge only the breeds which I love, you know. I there, you know, there is nothing outside of my and and this is this is really really wonderful. And I I like when people, um, I I I think that when you say it in that way, it's not that you are not uh, intelligent or that you don't have an eye for a dog or that you are you know too humble. But it's it's the way of you as a person that you don't that you really think you want to do a good job. And and I I really appreciate that. Um, this, um, you know, there is this um, fashion of so many judges going out there. The first thing, not being interesting for the public. Yeah. And see these people, you know, the caliber of, I don't know, Ellis Hume, really. Yeah. And Grace, who should be listening, but for God's sake, I believe that. Uh, you know, he, they, they, you know, they can keep your attention outside the ring, yeah, and yeah. Should be, you would be watching their hands and their eyes all the yeah. time. And then you go and see somebody who goes like, "Good this, good that, good the other." Oh, boring, and that's wow. not good for the sport, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, tell me, tell me, uh, Nicholas, when we are talking about judges, um, you are mentioning uh, names and people who are inspiration for you. But in general, I think as an exhibitor uh, and me also, we have this, you know, I'm going to enter because this is a good judge or no way I'm going to enter because this is a horrible judge. What is for you a good judge and what is for you a bad judge? 
Okay. Um, a good judge. Uh, I'm not. I'm not playing this game myself. I don't play this game, and I've been criticized for that. I remember very well. Um, maybe I can mention the name. Barry Croft told me uh, a couple of years back with a top top winning dog. Uh, we went to show that dog uh, in the UK, and he told me, "Didn't you do your homework before?" I said, "No, I didn't. Uh, no, I don't. If you have a good dog, uh, uh, and if you're like me, I mean, if you're, you know, if you're a totally devoted, you know, show dog person, then it's probably different. But I'm not. You know, I'm a little bit of a hobby in this in this area. So." I don't do so that much homework, uh, to be honest. Um, but, but if you are, I'm not saying it that way, but if you are talking about the qualities um, that one judge should have, in your opinion, to be a good judge, and of some maybe bad habits that we can see lately in some judges which you don't support, what would you say, you know, what is important for you to see in a judge and what you hate to see in one judge? I want to see a judge being interested in the breed. Uh, that he's doing. I see so often, excuse me to say that, judges that they go and judge dogs on their boards in the ring. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, a good friend from Greece who has been my mentor in many ways and he should be one of the people uh, that I should thank and I forgot is Stelios Makaritis, who you know, I'm sure. Okay. Uh, he's, he's, he used to say, uh, uh, this one is working his or her shoes when judging. I find this extremely annoying. Then you can see the way judges handle the dogs. Some judges can be very heavy handed. Yeah. Or you can see if a judge knows how to approach a dog and, you know, from the way he just moves around the dog in his hands. You can see if he wants to be done with it or. Um, Absolutely. So, that um, I find uh, boring and I find it's a big responsibility to judge dogs. Absolutely. Uh, it's all about traveling right, left and center all the time. Excuse me, but you know, if you're not interested in doing it, just do something else. Yeah, I, I agree 100% about that. Um, tell me, uh, ju just quick, quick question, uh, all breed show or a specialty show and why? Both. You more important or more exciting? Uh, specialty shows, really. Um, that, but that's because of the amount of showing I can do in my, I have been able to do in my life. I like going to both and I like, if I have a good dog, it should be a good dog, dog for both, uh, for both worlds, if you see what I mean. Yeah. And absolutely. that's important to me. I mean, I love specialist judges, of course I do. Everybody comes from a breed and we tend to have, but in Greek we say you can lose the wood for the trees at times. Yeah. Uh, and we need the, the all-rounders point of view. And every time you go outside your breed, you come back and you look at it from a fr with a fresh eye. Absolutely. I've earlier, free me the giant snouter, help me with all the English and all the English themselves have helped me to uh, help me. So. Absolutely. Um, okay, let's do another part of the interview, which is extremely uh, interesting for the people. I can tell you for sure that you are interesting because we are keeping the number of 100 people uh, online watching us from the moment we started till now. So it means that, that you are doing a good job. Um, let's let's start with the photos of your life. This is something which is always um, extremely, extremely, um, you know, interesting for the people because there are always some special dogs, some special people on these photos. We are starting with special people. There is a photo um, of Andrew, uh, the great Peter Green, Beth, and somebody. I'm not. I don't know who is the fourth person on the picture. My son. That cannot be you. I, I went, you know, but it's just a printed photo. But anyhow, tell us, tell us why did you use? The, I cannot why... see the picture myself, but uh, it is the picture. Yes, it's me. <laughs> it's me. <laughs> Are you sure? It's me. 
Okay. Okay. I, it didn't look like you, but if you say it's you, I trust you. I promise you, it's me. Okay. Yeah. I I I send this picture um, to you because it's very important, and I have to say what uh, really uh, I must be quick here, but it's not very easy for me. Uh, wonderful dog people like Peter Green and Beth. Uh, how much they can actually help a little silly guy at the time. This is many years ago. And uh, uh, to have this uh, year's Crafts Reserve Best in Show winner, I made a phone call to Peter many years ago and I said, oh, there is this litter down in, I don't remember where. And he, they took the car, they drove there and they got the shire of the beach that actually won uh, Crafts a few days ago. Uh, so helpful, so altruists, you know, offering so much. I mean, who could think that a guy like me would call Peter Green and ask a favor like that? And they did. They did the driving, they yeah. did everything, and they went and evaluated the puppies, and then we got Lover, and then Lover went to New Zealand, and uh, I cannot thank them enough. I love I love that Andrew is sending me a private message to tell me that it's bet on the on the picture. Obviously, I have recognized bet. Uh, I, I mean, I have recognized Peter. I have recognized bet. I have recognized uh, Andrew, but I didn't recognize Nicholas. This is the only one that I didn't recognize on the photo. The other three um, I know very well. I can say from my own side, um, and it has been. I'm not going to say what it was exactly, and it really doesn't matter. But it was also through Andrew and his friendship with Peter uh, that Peter, in one important thing of my life, has been so nice and so helpful and so amazing. Uh, so absolutely, I can understand what you are saying about him. And then, of course, Peter um, uh, um, uh, Andrew has written me in the message, and I want to use this opportunity and say um, a huge, huge congratulations to Beth. Uh, for getting the assignment to judge best in show at Westminster this year, next month, actually, uh, absolutely well deserved. And I'm sure we will be all, uh, you know, uh, me unfortunately glued to the screen, not seeing it live, but I'm sure that that uh, Beth is going to do a great, great job. So, from my side, congratulations once again. Um, let's continue, uh, Nicholas, with the photos of your life. Um, tell us what is this photo representing for you? This is in the same picture, um, one of my greatest idols, Christina Bailey. Uh, you can see she won uh, uh, Best Opposite Sex at Crafts. I believe 2004 or 2005, that was the first time um, I had ever an involvement with Crafts. And Gilly Bennett judging, that was Cosmo. And it was, you know, the three of us in the same picture on that day. Um, and winning, it was, uh, you know, the beginning. And that was after Cosmo was put up at the World Show as a junior, actually, to win Best of Breed under Carlos Ivich, who said to me, now, who the hell are you? What is this dog? <laughs> what did I do? <laughs> yeah, wonderful. Uh, well, to say something, uh, how, how you say it uh, in English, uh, you know, to say that it's not only me, another great friend of yours, um, uh, Faye Kefala, wrote, I also didn't recognize him on the photo, so it's okay, it was, it was not only me. Um, anyhow, let's, let's continue with the photos of your life. This must be the, the main ring of crafts. Yes. Uh, tell us why this photo. Well, um, you know, uh, personally, uh, this year it was Matteo Handling and... Uh, reading and he did a fabulous job but as far as my, as i am personally concerned that was the furthest uh, up i've ever been in my life uh, again uh, a pet living at somebody's house <laughs> not <Okay. with> us. <laughs> so it was uh, a beautiful moment i will never uh, you know forget it and i will treasure it forever of course wonderful um, let's talk now about the next photo what is this about? This is uh, wonderful. This is a photo. Uh, this is the specialty, uh, the Euro OES. I suggest every breed to have a show like that. It's a wonderful atmosphere. 
It's probably the biggest show of our breed. It's bigger than the American nationals. It's um, the most important uh, for that part of the of the world. And I've won the uh, best breeder many times. And this is like with two new people in the breed, three actually, none of these dogs um, live with me. And I've won for, I don't know how many times, quite a few. I've won top breeder at that show with some other wonderful breeder, big breeders, of course. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, okay, we are going on with a, a photo of one of your dogs. Tell us who is this? This is Ariakas Cosmo Jr. And I wanted that picture for never to forget and not mention Elizabeth and this wonderful dog and what she did for me and for the breed with him. Everything. And uh, I'm ever so grateful to her and to this dog. He had uh, uh, brothers and sisters, top winning too and UK champions, that was a litter that produced three UK champions from one litter, born in Paris, that was a little bit strange at the time, but um, I, that was the best picture of CJ. It was his other side that I always uh, liked more. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, we are going to Greece um, and two lovely dogs standing under the olive trees. Tell us why this photo. This photo was made by the wonderful Anna, Anna Zabo. She came to Greece at some point, and they were, I wasn't even here, but uh, she found a beautiful place. These dogs uh, are two uh, champions. Um, unfortunately, one is not alive anymore uh, because of the bloat, um, and uh, it was such a special dog in so many ways. And, um, you know, uh, I wanted to say that these dogs not only play uh, in the English countryside, they can also live very well in Greece. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Uh, this should be, if I can read well, the sign um, European OS show in 2016. We are going from dogs a little bit to people. Yeah, this is the wonderful Lisa. And this is the wonderful Euro OES with Helen Harris and Paola and Matteo. Uh, and um, I want to say how wonderful the spirit again is at that show. And what a wonderful time we all have. And everybody who hasn't been should be. If there is any old English sheepdog person watching, definitely this show is a must. Wonderful. Um, here is the photo you said you wanted to show it because it's both you and Matteo competing in the same class. Yes. Well, um, um, this is Crafts this year, and uh, I was showing Liliana, um, Highlands Liliana from the UK, uh, that I co-own for all sorts of rules and regulations that you realize, but she's uh, out of uh, uh, Stefania, who's been, again, a champion. She won Crafts. Uh, too. And uh, uh, so uh, Matteo hadn't really handled uh, Blondie or Delia before. I call her Delia because her name comes from Delos, the ancient uh, sacred Greek island. But there are as far as they call her Blondie, for God's sake. But anyway, <laughs> so, <coughs> we, call, we have to call her Blondie. How bad is that? Now, now after crafts, you have lost your battle. Everybody knows her as Blondie now. No, I know. Blondie and Iggy uh, on Instagram, my God. Uh, you, you won't know how many notifications I get per day. I just get <laughs> lost. Uh, yes, her dad is, uh, you know, uh, very, uh, well, maniac probably about that. Anyway, um, now the picture was because um, uh, everybody was saying, are you crazy? Are you showing too big, too open? Uh, Bitches in the same class, one against the other. I said, well, it's the judge's job to, to do, the, do the judging. It's not mine. I do the best I can. <laughs> and, and Matteo did obviously the same. So yeah. you, we show the best we have, and this is it. <laughs> yeah. Probably one against each other. It doesn't matter. And the guy Lahore did a great job, obviously. Yeah. As long as it stays in the family, it's okay. I always say it like this. The, okay, what? Well, this is, I think you told me, something that happened after Crafts. Exactly. Yes. 
This is um, the bitch I was showing at Crafts, who became a champion one week after Crafts. Okay. So I came back home and then I went to, back to, to, to Glasgow, actually, to show her. Okay. To her title. So um, an English champion title is very important to me. And um, I've made up a few. Don't ask me how many because I don't know. Okay. But I don't count numbers, but uh, and I wanted this picture for uh, to show the uh, the friendship, friendship and devotion that uh, we have with Helen Harris, the mom of that bitch, really the owner of that bitch and breeder uh, for so many years. And I want to, I cannot find enough wor words to stress the fact how much teamwork is important and how much breeders should share what they have with other people. Absolutely. Um, uh, as, as it should be, um, we are closing the photos of your life with something very special. Um, I think this, this photo shows a lot. I think it shows love, it shows respect, it shows teamwork, it shows everything that we treasure in the dog world. Um, tell us about that. I would like to say that this picture, uh, this uh, picture, this photo shows love, actually. And uh, what you see there, and what you don't, see, you don't see behind it. And that I want to say to you know to people. Um, obviously, in this picture is not Luisa, uh, which is missing, but uh, she's there. Uh, as much as uh, she's not uh, visible, although she's not visible, she's definitely there, is the groomer, is uh, Blondie's, Ordelia's dad. I just bought it. I was there. thinking like I'm going to make you happy and I'm going to say, and it's a beautiful Delia, you know, to make your day. <laughs> but now you also start with Blondie. <laughs> oh, I do, I do. Well, what can you do, you know? Uh, you have to go with uh, the flow, yeah. No, there's nothing. Can you can you swim against it? It's Blondie and Iggy, you know. Yeah. So uh, this picture, it's obviously only uh, Blondie, Mater, and myself. But there's so um, what I wanted to actually say, it's love. The one you see and the one that's behind that. Yeah. yeah um, absolutely. Wonderful, um, Nicholas. I have two more questions for you. Uh, we have been talking for two hours, um, and as I said, in two hours we didn't lose any viewers. That's always a great sign, uh, so I'm happy about that. Uh, tell me, you have mentioned during these last two hours many times uh, mentors, people who were inspiration for you in one way or another. Um, you have mentioned teamwork, you have mentioned love. Um, when you see somebody young, uh, you know, who is approaching you and trying to become successful in the in the world of dogs um, and dog shows, doesn't matter as a breeder, handler, a groomer, whatever you want. What is, let's say, one advice that you would say to this person how to become successful? Um, the first thing is get at least a good mentor. <laughs> um, okay. At least one. Um, I've you know, I've said it before, I mean, I've probably answered to your question already a little bit or a little bit more. Um, then have passion for what you do. Uh, avoid the people who want the shortcuts. I find it so boring. <laughs> I was criticized by somebody um, a few days ago who's definitely watching. He said, oh, why do you have to do the challenging things? Does it always have to be a challenge? Of course it has to be a challenge. Yeah. Then what? If it's not a challenge, it's, it's what? You know, it's just a walk. It's yeah. not. Uh, study. I mean, study. And a big thing uh, that I was advised that, I, Julie, said, Julie said that to me earlier. She said, say one thing. And she said, it, she put in beautiful words, close your mouth. Open up, your, open up your eyes and open up your ears and shut up. <laughs> Excuse me. Don't yeah, speak too it much. Is, it is a wonderful advice. Absolutely. It's not and, mine. I've stolen it from Julie, I must yeah. say. <laughs> oh, well, I, I'm saying to Julie, not to you. It's yeah. a wonderful, adv absolutely wonderful advice. I think 
nowadays um, people like like to speak a lot um, and they don't like to watch and they don't like to listen uh, this should definitely definitely um, change at some point um, for the end of this and interview avoid keyboard yes. warriors please avoid keyboard war experience real experience uh, can never be you know can never be replaced to anything really all these people sitting behind their keyboards, breathing, saying, doing, knowing everything about everything, please, you know. Yeah, I always say, you know, people people love to write and people like to complain. And I say everybody of us has the possibility in a real world to prove the things, you know. Doesn't matter as a breather, as a handler, as a as a owner, as a judge, as whatever. So yeah. no need to write big stories, no need to you know, to, to make a, a dramas of everything, just go out and prove it. You can do it better, be my guest. Yeah. I, that's, that's very good. Um, tell me for the end of this interview, Nicolas, um, uh, from one side, um, the dog world in general is experiencing maybe one of the uh, most difficult years. Uh, we are being uh, slowly killed by governments, rules, uh, and all kinds of things. Um, you know, from not only, not only, I mean, I remember I, I was speaking even with uh, with Joanna while she was the president of the Green Kennel Club. I know you already had troubles there with the new welfare laws and, and everything. Um, how do you see the future of the sport in general? Do you think that, let's say, in 10 years, we are going to have same dog shows as we have now? Um, same breeding rules as we have now and in the same way how do you see your own future um, in a dog world what is what are the next challenges in front of you okay i'll ask i'll, I'll answer very quickly about myself i have some uh, wonderful challenges i've already um contacted a few friends of mine about the very um um, interesting mating that I want to do in the future. So, okay. and uh, a couple of years ago, I was saying to Luisa, "Oh, I suppose I don't really want to breed another litter ever again, but I cannot stop." So, um, um, I won't say much more about my own future. I will do what I can and uh, devote the time and passion that I have in that. As for the future of the sport. Um, I would like us, talking about myself first, to communicate out there uh, what is this sport, what, is the, what this is all about. Because I believe we have not done well at all. I'm sorry. Um, the, I, will say, I will tell you a little uh, silly example. How is possible that Greece which is a country with so many thousands of years of history, does, uh, only has one breed recognized as a national breed by the FCI. I mean, the minute you say it, it sounds totally ridiculous. Yeah. First of all, for us Greeks, myself first, as, but for the FCI it's, itself. The only one which is recognized is the um, is the uh, Greek, uh, uh, Greek pound, but tell me, uh, I, I, I uh, something I remember that from the show. How you say it in Greek? In Greek, Elinikos Hellenic Ichnipatis. Yeah, yeah, this this one I know, but then there is the only one. Please, please help me now. Uh, there is this breed. Wonderful, cute little breed that Stelios is breeding. Yes. Uh, what is the name? Coconi. Coconi. Oh, I love Coconis. Love yes. Coconis. Okay. But have you seen the Cretan dog? Yeah, yeah, I have seen many, many of these Greek breeds which are not recognized at the shows in Greek. How uh, is that possible? How, yeah. how can, you know, really between us? I'm yeah. sorry, I'm not being correct. I'm sure I'm not being fully incorrect. But how is it possible that the FCI doesn't help a small country like this to want to recognize more breeds? Where is the history of this, of this country? And where is the history of the dog kind next to humans? Yeah. 
for so many thousands of years. And can we actually, talking about the future of the sport, can we actually recognize and say that dogs are bred by humans for all these thousands of years and they are part of, their, of, our, of our civilization, living part? I mean, why should the castle in, uh, in Minas, in Crete, be important? And the Cretan ha uh, dog should not be important. Absolutely, I, so, I, agree, I agree with you 100%. No doubts about that. Well, that's that's something that uh, you know it's not too late for that. I hope that the Greek Kennel Club um, is working on that, and I hope that some of these breeds um, are going to get the recognition in the in the future. Because you said yourself, I mean, Greece is a is a, is a country with such a amazing amazing history. And there are so many of these wonderful breeds that deserve to be to be recognized. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I, I was thinking this will be the end of my questions, but there is one more question which I need to ask, and I'm not allowed to uh, say who is asking the question, but I'm sure you will connect the dots very quickly. It says, did Nicholas ever get a memorable critique on a dog that didn't win best to breed? <laughs> I know exactly okay. uh, who makes the question. Um, you will know. I have to tell you how we became friends with Andrew. Um, okay. I wasn't about to do, to show um, the dog, Freni, uh, at the time, and uh, because uh, it was a, a very bad time for all sorts of reasons. And then I got this call from Athens, you know, change of judge. Andrew Brace is judging. And I go like, we didn't know him in each other. Andrew Brace was that distant, you know, <laughs> legend that was uh, writing uh, on the dog papers and what what have you. So okay, here I am, all the way from Paris to Athens, and then he wrote a critique about Frenny, which I had clicked because I had decided by that time to retire her. Okay. And he wrote a critique about her that was like um, a poem, really. Um, and uh, I, I can still remember it, apparently. Um, and uh, uh, this is it. So he lose. He you made didn't win best of breed. <laughs> yeah, I didn't win best of breed. He made me lose. And, uh, and he was so right about what he did. And this is how we became the friends we are for so many years. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay, uh, Nicholas, before we finish the evening, uh, let me read to you just a few, um, few comments that we got uh, now at, at the end. Um, Diane Stewart Rich is saying, lovely interview, shows the professional person, but yet so kind and such a wonderful person. Proud and delighted to have you as a new friend. We are in the Mutual Appreciation Society. Love you. Um, Who is Darwin, it? What a great night. Thank you both. Uh, let me see. Uh, Carme Bulosole, our friend, mutual friend from Spain, saying, Nicolas and Matteo, you are amazing breeders, but above all, you are uh, wonderful people. Um, Andrea is saying it was, uh, as I expected, a very interesting interview. Thank you, Ante, for your good questions and Nicolas for your open minded answers. You should have a look on Russian toy dog for a companion. They are very reliable to the right persons. Monica saying thank you for this wonderful uh, interview. Uh, such a delight to listen to your stories. Nicola, congratulations to all your friends and family. Vanya saying thank you, Ante and Nicolas, for a wonderful and interesting evening. Great memories, loving, happy moments. So happy for your success. Cheers. So there are a lot of nice comments coming now. Um, among the fact that that uh, that there have been 100 people uh, watching it live, I hope you will have the possibility. Is that Delia? Yes, it is Delia. Blanc. How nice I am to you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm calling her by her real name. Um, anyhow, name. I wanted, yeah, I wanted to say that um, that uh, uh, that there have been almost 140 comments during our interview. So I hope you will find a little bit of time and read all the nice things that people wrote about you during the interview. Uh, next Wednesday, I'm going to have a round table. Um, I'm still not going to tell you who are going to be my guests, but I'm sure it's going to be an interesting 
um, roundtable, um, and we are going to discuss uh, some interesting topics uh, uh, of the moment. Um, I want to say, Nicolas, a huge thank you to you for accepting my invitation, for um, getting us a wonderful evening. Evening. Uh, I love the fact, you know, when you can talk to somebody and have a feeling that you are just in some living room somewhere, you know, talking to a friend and not thinking of all the people around who are watching. And, you know, to have this feeling that everybody is actually um, enjoying it. Uh, thank you so much for, for, for the evening. And as usual, I'm leaving the last words of the evening to you to say something to all the people who were watching this live, but to so many people who are going to see this um, also in the future. Uh, thank you to you. Thank you to everybody. Thank you. Uh, and thank you to dogs, really, for uh, having changed my life. Uh, in so many ways. Um, I say dogs influence uh, people, uh, people's lives. Um, I'm definitely the number one example uh, of that. So I owe so much to dogs. They traveled me to so many places. They've made me meet so many different people. And as you personally know, they totally changed my life yeah. in so many ways. So, you know, if we want to speak about the future of our sport, I think uh, this is actually one thing to speak about. Yeah. Talk yeah. about out in, loud. Yeah, I, 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 I often think about this. I don't know if you think about this, but I often think about, you know, what would my life be, where I would be, and with which friends I would be surrounded if I didn't go one day to a dog show you know, and decided that that was the way I wanted to go. I mean, the, the things are uh, crazy. Uh, thank you, Nicola, so much once again for accepting my invitation. Thank you for being honest and, and kind and, and uh, wonderful with your answers, uh, sharing your experience and knowledge, not only about the breed, but about the dog world in general. Um, a lot of people are writing now wonderful words about you, so I hope you will have time to read them. Thank you, everybody, for watching, and see you all next Wednesday, same place, same time. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye. Bye to everyone. Quando lottiamo per migliorarci, tutto intorno a noi diventa più bello. Non ci sono passi falsi. Se l'obiettivo è dare il massimo per noi stessi e per chi è sempre al nostro fianco. In Monge lo sappiamo. Perché ciò che facciamo bene oggi migliora i nostri domani. Con questa filosofia vi offriamo il meglio della nostra esperienza. Monge Natural Super Premium. Alimenti made in Italy di alta qualità per il benessere dei nostri amici a quattro zampe. Monge, la famiglia italiana del pet food.